Hi there, kids. You know what I am? Uh, hey, baseball uh, man. Space Brown. Baseball player. Your, your hat says Space Brown. That's yeah. exactly right. I'm a player on the Faith, uh, Faith Realm team. See, says so. Damn. This is my uniform. Oh, by the way, my name is Babe Truth. <laughs> what? Babe Truth. Yeah, that's right. And uh, like our uniform colors here, black and white. They're like God's word. Everything's black and white, either right or wrong. There is no gray area. That's why our uniforms are black and white. Anyway, thought I'd come here tonight to teach you kids about baseball Ooh. and biblical things. You know, Jesus taught in parables. Did you know that? No. So did Paul. You remember Paul? He used everyday things to illustrate God's word. Like uh, in Ephesians, for example. Now, Ephesians, is that in the Old Testament or New Testament, kids? Oh. Strike one. New. Foul ball. You're right. It's a new. <laughs> Ephesians 6 11. <clears throat> it's what Apostle Paul wrote. Put on the whole armor of God that you may stand. Be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, you know why Paul used illustrations like that? Well, back in Paul's day, there were a lot of Roman soldiers around. And they had uh, their armor and stuff. And people would see those soldiers every day. So Paul knew that he had to use an illustration of something that people would look at every day. To remind him of the lessons and principles he was teaching. Anyway, that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to use baseball to do the same thing. How many of you kids like baseball, first of all? Any of you kids like baseball? Johnny Nunn, if you do. I play T-ball. You play, play T-ball, okay. That's good. Now, baseball, of course, is a sport. Amen. I, now, I looked up that word, sport, or rather sporting, in Strong's Concordance. You know what Strong's Concordance is, kids? No. Some of you little kids might not know. Some of you adults should know. You teenagers maybe might know. It's something that has every word that's in the Bible. And I mean every word. And it tells you where you can find that word. And so if you want to do a word study, that's where you go. Now, it's not a substitute for the Bible, of course, but it's a, it's a good help. But I couldn't find the word sport anywhere in the Bible. But I did find the word sporting. Kind of sounds like sports, doesn't it? And the only mention of it, well, kind of anyway, is in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Let me read that to you real quick. Now, this is kind of important. <laughs> but these as natural brute beast made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Now, kids might be wondering, what in the world does that got to do with baseball? Would you like to know? Shout amen if you would. Amen. Are you sure? Yes. Heads up. <laughs> now, now, in today's world, in 2021, <clears throat> in the world of baseball, it's kind of a shame that a lot of players nowadays, they refuse to sing the National Anthem or recite the Pledge of Allegiance. 
because of their political beliefs. Now, you kids think that's right? Of course not, that's not right. Now, that scripture I just read you a minute ago, you know, that explains those people to a T, doesn't it? Yeah. And that was written 2,000 years ago. So in a way, it was kind of prophetic. Which reminds me of something else. Baseball. You know, when it all started, when did baseball begin, you think? Mm. Hasn't been around all that long, relatively speaking. It was invented back in the 1800s, in 1839, by a fellow named Abner Doubleday. Some of y'all probably never heard of him. And it was in Cooperstown, New York. Now, the first recorded baseball game happened 10 years later, which would have been 1849. Now, this is 2021. Baseball's been around quite a while, hasn't it? It was here before basketball and football. It became America's number one pastime. Church ought to be number one pastime, amen? Amen! That's kind of a weak amen. Amen! Okay, she's getting filled with the spirit, I can tell. Now, I'm just going to take a few minutes here to explain how baseball is played. For some of you real little kids, you might not know this. Now, first of all, in baseball, got two teams. You're going to be on one team, and there's going to be other people on another team. Now, each team has nine players. Now, there's four bases. Now, this right here is called a baseball diamond. You ever all ever see a baseball diamond before? No. That's what it looks like. Shaped like a diamond, see? Now, there's going to be nine players now, right up here, this is called the home plate. It's also where you bat from. Okay? That's where that guy stands up there with that bat. Now, way over here, that's called first base. Now, way back here, this is called second base. This is called third base. And when you run from third back to this home plate, you hit a home run or you got a home run. That's kind of what the game's all about. But this is where you start right here. Now, behind that batter, the guy's up there with a the bat, there's somebody standing right there behind him. Got his hat on backwards, got a little cage in front of his face. He's called a catcher. You know why? Because he catches things. Because he catches the balls that are thrown. That's exactly right. Now, he belongs to the other team. He's not on your team. Now, behind that catcher, there's a funny looking fella. He's got a, looks like a turtle uh, thing on top of him there to protect his body and stuff. He's called an umpire. And uh, he's supposed to watch him, watch those balls coming across and tell if they're a, a strike or a foul ball or he's supposed to watch anyway. Sometimes they don't. Now, the pitcher, he's going to throw that ball to that catcher back there. And that batter tries to hit that ball with the bat. Like that. Sometimes he swings and misses. Now, if you swing and miss, what is that called? Strike. That's right. Strike one. Now, you get three strikes. Now, if he did hit that ball, he's going to try to make that first place before anybody catches it. Now, if they catch it out there, he's out automatically. But if they don't catch it, they're going to try to throw it to that first base before that batter gets there. So you got to run mighty fast to get there. Now, supposing that, that batter got struck out. Well, the next batter comes up. He's going to try the same thing. Now, he might get a hit. He might not. He might get struck out too. Now, if that happens three times, the teams are going to change. Your team's going to go outfield, and the outfield's going to come infield. Because that's called an inning. There's nine innings in a game. Remember that. Now, when a batter hits that ball, though, when it goes way up in the air, and that guy way out there in the field, he's going to be looking up there, and he's going to want to catch that ball. Now, if he doesn't catch it, he better know how to throw it pretty quick. I think I already told you that. 
Now, the object of the game is to get around all them bases. Sometimes, and this has been my experience, I've hit that ball so far that it went way over that fence, way over there. I call a home run. Nobody caught that ball. So, they will run all the way around those bases. Nobody gonna stop you because they don't have the ball. Now the goal is to get the home base. Now the team with the most runs, that's what that's called, win. they're gonna win. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now y'all might be wondering, how can baseball illustrate God's principles? I know you're all probably wondering. But before I do that, you kids like jokes? Yes! Shout them out if you do. <laughs> That's right. You know, Proverbs 17, 22 says, Laughter doth like a good medicine. Amen? Yes! Amen! That's right. Heads up! Amen! Oh! <laughs> foul ball! <laughs> Fooled ya! <laughs> Alright. Let's have some fun here. Here's some good ones for you kids. These are kid jokes. Why are frogs good baseball players? I don't know. Because they jump. No, because they're great at catching flies. Lime. Ah, here's one for you. Why don't matches play baseball? Because they get one strike and they're out. I know these are goofy and corny, but they're funny. You, do you know that uh, baseball is 90% mental? The other half is physical. That went over your head, didn't it? <laughs> Why are baseball players so rich? Because they play on diamonds. Okay. Now, here's where we can use the game of baseball to illustrate God's word. I was just playing with you right there. Now, let's pretend that this game of baseball, which is nine innings long, represents time, your time on earth, your whole life. And each inning that is played will represent, say, 10 years. And the entire game is during your lifetime here on earth as a Christian. Now, that's very important, though. Now, home plate, we're going to call that home plate heaven because that's where we're eventually all going to go. Amen? Amen! It took you a couple of minutes to get there, didn't it? Now, now that other team is going to be the devil and the world and all the evil people out there. They're going to be throwing the ball at you when you're up the bat. And that devil, he's going to pitch you some fastballs and some curveballs. He's going to try to strike you out. Now his pitches are basically like his lies and his deceptions, his fiery darts, so to speak. Now, your bat, though, it's the Word of God. And you must use it in faith, though. And hopefully you practice that faith, just like in baseball, when you go up there to hit, you just don't go up there the first time ever and hit the ball. You gotta practice all the time. Same thing with God's Word and faith. You gotta exercise that faith and practice it in order for it to work so you can hit a home run. Now, as it says in Ephesians chapter six, which we all know is in the New Testament, right, kids? Yes. Okay. Ephesians 6, 16 and 17. Now, this is Paul writing again. Remember, he's using illustrations of things that everybody is familiar with. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So that bat's kind of like your sword, the Word of God. Now let's suppose you do hit one of the devil's curved balls, and hopefully you will, and you make it to first base. Now the next batter up on your team is going to try to get a hit too, so you can move to, what base is that? Uh, second. Second base. Now, in order for you to get there, that next batter's got to get a, a hit, make it to first so you can get to second. And it's very important you to know that you're not the only one on the team. There's other team members there, and you all must be in one accord to win. Same thing with church. 
If you want to win people over and you want to operate in faith, you need to be all in one accord, all on the same team. Amen? Amen. Don't you go to sleep on me. <laughs> now, sometimes, maybe the devil might strike you out, but remember, there are nine endings, remember? And you'll get another chance at the bat. Now, sometimes, this is something that happens occasionally, you get hit with the ball that's pitched at you. So you're up there getting ready to hit that ball that that devil's throwing you, and say it hits you. Ooh. What do you think happens when that happens? You know what you know what you know what you get to do? It's called walk. You automatically get to go to that base. Now, that kind of reminds me of a scripture. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord. Amen. So if you get here with that ball, it might have been a good thing. You got to take first base. Didn't even have to hit the ball. Now, when your team is not at bat, though, you're all in the field, you'll have a pitcher and a catcher, first, not first, second, and third. You're also going to have some outfielders. Now, I haven't really explained these guys that much. This fellow way out here, he's going to be way out there. He's in left field. Now, there's going to be one way back here. He's going to be in center field. And over here is right field. Now, sometimes, some of those batters are really good, and they're going to they're going to clobber that ball, and it's going to go way up there. That's what those outfielders are supposed to do, catch that ball. Now, that's eight players I just mentioned. Yeah, but there's nine players. Didn't I mention that before? Where do you think the ninth player is? In the middle. You're kind of right. He's between second and third base. He's called a shortstop. Now, the shortstop does. Suppose uh, you're outfield and the devil's batting at you there. And the devil's got uh, a guy on first and second base there. And that second baseman there, he's of the devil. He wants to steal something because he's good at stealing, amen? amen? Now, to keep him from getting to that third base, that shortstop's He's going to be uh, helping, uh, be helped out here by the catcher, or maybe one of the guys. The pitcher going to throw the ball to the guy in the middle there, the shortstop. See that? The devil's going to try to run across there before the ball is actually pitched. They're going to throw that ball back and forth until they finally tag him. And what I mean by tag him is when they got their glove, and all they got to do is just basically touch him, and they're out. Now, when you're outfield, it's kind of like like you're in church. The devil's going to try to sow discord. All your mongers must be in one accord. Remember that now. Now, to strike out the devil's players, in other words, uh, here's what you got to do. You got to be watching. You got to be attention. You got to keep your eye on the ball. That means you got to be aware of what the devil's doing. Now, he's going to try to keep you from getting that home plate, remember? He's going to try every dirty trick he knows. One of the tricks he knows something a lot of you do here that little cell phone thingy you got there you spend more time on that than you do reading the word sometimes well guess what's going to happen during that time you're wasting that was going to stick some stuff there. and i might look innocent enough some of the things you're looking at but there might be some poison in there you need to watch out for you're not going to win the game now another thing the devil's up there to bat, and he's hitting his balls out there. What we're all going to try to do is catch those balls and strike them out or catch them out. Basically, what we're doing is we're going to expose the devil's lies and his false doctrines. That's another thing he's going to want to do. See, that other team's going to taunt you. I don't know if you've ever been to a real baseball game. The other team's going to say some pretty nasty things to you, especially when you're on base. They're going to try to get your mind off the game. That's, what they're going to try. That's all they're doing. They're trying to distract you. They're trying to distract you. Heads up! Ooh, that's a grounder. Don't go very far on that one. Oh, I can hit him real hard if I want to. I just want to hit your buddy in the head. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I do. just a plushy toy. Just smile at Now, 
Our entire Christian walk in life is kind of like a baseball game. Our goal is to reach that home plate, which is heaven. Now, let me explain home plate a little bit better. Now, the devil's catcher is there as well. Now, he's going to try to physically block you from reaching home plate. I don't know if you've ever seen a baseball game. The guy on third, he's running towards home as fast as he can. Now, that catcher, he's going to stand in front of that plate, and he's going to try to block you from getting there. The devil's going to try the same thing. And he might physically try to stop you. He might give you some illness that you weren't aware you were going to get, maybe because you're slipping up a little bit in your Christian walk. I don't know. But he's going to try to trip you up. Now just remember, the devil is going to cheat every chance he gets. Now again, behind the catcher though, who's behind the catcher again? The umpire. The umpire is Jesus. He's going to judge every play that's played on both teams. Someday, you're going to find out who won that game. Now, I'm going to read another scripture to you. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, is that in the New Testament or Old Testament? You know Ezra? 2 Timothy? Uh, oh. Pastor's yeah. son. You really no. should. Now, there you go. He had to kind of think about it, but he got it. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, this is what it says. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So he's the major umpire. Now, our pitcher, when we're in the infield there, he's our pastor or our teachers. He's the apostles or the prophets. They're the ones that are going to throw the word of God to the devil's crowd in the world. Now, he's a real important person. Now, we want to strike the other team out, so we need to read and study the Bible so we'll have the scriptures to do it. Now, you can't strike them out unless you know those scriptures, though. Oh, something I forgot to mention. The spectators in the crowd, in the stadium there, a lot of them are the secular world, and they're watching that game very closely. Watching sinner and saint alike. They're seeing what's going to happen here. That's why we got to be a good team, a good witness to them. Because they're going to watch us. Okay, tell you what. Got one more joke for you. Actually, this is more of a story. This is God. I thought this was a real good one. There's these two old men that had been best friends for years, and they both lived to their early 90s. Suddenly, one of them falls down deathly ill. His friend comes to visit him on his deathbed. And they're reminiscing about their long friendship. When the man's friend asked a question, listen, when you die, do me a favor. I want to know if there's baseball in heaven. The dying man said, We've been friends for years. This I'll do for you. And then he dies. A couple of days later, his surviving friend is sleeping when he hears his friend's voice. And the voice says, Hey, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that there is baseball in heaven. What's the bad news? Uh, you're pitching tomorrow. What's that? Heads up. Heads up. <laughs> Got one more left to go. Who wants to catch it? Oh, almost. <laughs> All right. Now, how many of you kids want to make it to home play? Which is heaven. I know you teenagers probably do. Yeah, I see you raising your hand there. That's good. Now, first of all, to even get on the team, you know what, what qualifications are? Uh, you got to be born again. Now, if anyone want to be on this team, that's what you got to do. Now, remember, Jesus, he's preparing a place for us. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. 
And if there's mansions, who knows? There might be baseball teams up there. Who knows? Now, also remember this. If there ever is a baseball game on Sunday, uh, don't let it take the place of going to church, though. You know why? Because God's keeping score. Okay. So, play ball. Have fun. No, this is a real bad. Oh, look at that.